First of all, I, I want to say a few words and then I want to let the, the uh, mayors and the judges are available because uh, we do have media not only from the Valley, but we also have uh, some of the national media also. Uh, and we also have media from San Antonio and Laredo uh, that are on this uh, Zoom. Uh, so we will, I'll say a few words and then uh, after that, uh, no particular order, I'll, I'll let the uh, folks, because we got folks here from different uh, counties, and as you know, we did have people from Dorio uh, all the way down to uh, Brownsville. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I think some of y'all have heard me for the last six months. Uh, what I've been asking uh, the um, administration is not only listen to the immigration activists, but you need to listen to the border communities and you also need to listen uh, to the men and women in green and blue DHS. Uh, I want to thank the secretary because they've done a couple things uh, that are important. And that is, uh, as you said, as I've said in the past, uh, we got to have some sort of um, uh, repercussions. You just can't let people coming in uh, to just come in. And about a week ago, uh, the administration started uh, 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 deporting people under Title 42, expelling people under Title 42, but they're flying them uh, down uh, to uh, the southern part of Mexico, and then Mexico is busting them over to Guatemala. I think that is very, very important, but we need to do more to show people uh, visuals uh, that don't come, otherwise we're going to deport you. And again, I believe in legal migration, I don't believe in illegal migration. Uh, and as we've said in the past, if you have 100 people that ask for asylum, uh, 10 to 12 percent are going to be accepted, and the other 90 to 88 percent are going to be rejected. So why are we letting everybody uh, in? So uh, that is one thing. The second thing is the secretary, uh, and I want to thank him for being here, because it's not only the immigration activists, uh, but it's also listening to the border communities and as I've said, all I'm doing is just uh, pretty much repeating or echoing what the border communities and I'll let them say a few in a few minutes uh, the same thing that I've been saying for uh, for a long time. And I think it's important uh, for them to hear this. The second of all, the men and women in green and blue need help. Bottom line, they're 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 strained. Uh, they're overworked. Uh, they don't need just a pat in the back. They actually need the resources, as many of the mayors and the county judges, they need the technology, the personnel, the equipment, uh, so they can do their job. What are we looking at? Let me give you the latest numbers as of October, well, from uh, the fiscal year that started October 1st of 2020 to August 11th uh, of just, you know, just yesterday. Let me give you the total encounters. And keep in mind the encounters, the numbers, for uh, are the ones that don't even include the getaways. Getaways could be, and I've asked this question, it could be 10%, 15%, 20%. So whatever numbers I give you, you can add some numbers to the getaways. Total encounters uh, as of 8-11-2021 for FY21, total encounters were 1.3 uh, plus million individuals for the whole uh, U.S. Texas is handling about 67% of all the encounters, which adds up to uh, almost eight, uh, 800, uh, 897,000 individuals. Let me give you the sector by sector encounters, total encounters. El Paso for FY21, 163,000 individuals. I'm just running them just off a little bit. The Rio sector, 194,000 uh, individuals. Uh, Laredo, the Laredo sector is about 98,000 uh, 98, uh, individuals. And then the Rio Grande Valley, uh, 443,000. So the majority of the people that are coming here. Basically, the Rio Grande Valley is getting about 20,000 individuals, a little bit over 20,000 individuals a week, a week. So this is where uh, the work is, uh, is being done. We talked about several things, um, uh, expelling people, putting that as, as they're flying down people. We've also said you cannot play defense on the one yard line. And for many years I've been saying, if you play defense on the one yard line here at the US-Mexico border, you're gonna lose out. Uh, you gotta play defense on their, 
uh, one yard line, which is working with on the southern border with Mexico uh, and Guatemala and those countries. So we've talked about that. As you know, a couple of days ago, Secretary Mayorkas was in Mexico along with the assistant secretary or the uh, security person at the White House, uh, Tony Blinken, and uh, they uh, they talked about um, uh, about some of the work that's being done over there. Uh, what exactly we did ask that question, I think they will we'll talk about that later. But the bottom line is, Mexico, our neighbors in the South can do more. They can do more. They've done it in the past. In fact, uh, back in 2015, 2016, uh, they were actually deporting more people than the U.S. Border Patrol was doing. So I can say they can do a lot more. And, you know, how they negotiate that, how they work that out, that's, uh, that will be revealed later on. But I can say that on that meeting, uh, about 7 million plus vaccines were given or are going to be given to Mexico for different reasons. But again, there are ways that we can work with Mexico. Uh, the non-essential, I'll finish with this, non-essential uh, border crossings, we were very uh, open about that. Uh, we, you know, in talking to him, you know, we see uh, Mexicans fly in. We see undocumented people come in, but the legal visa holders that spend before the pandemic over $19 billion are not coming in, are not coming in. Um, we got to work with Mexico, and I think everybody uh, saw this story where Abran uh, um, basically, and I need to send him a WhatsApp and ask him, uh, but he's basically saying we don't think it's going to happen on August 21st, but we're hoping that after that, we cannot let another shopping month, uh, season go by because that's that's where most of the uh, businesses on the border make their business. Uh, so again, uh, you know what's going to happen? What happened? Uh, I think uh, you know we're asking that. So what really happened from here? I think it was more in the listening uh, mode. I, he met again with the border sheriffs uh, and the police chiefs this morning. He's going to be meeting with the NGOs. He met with. Uh, uh, mayors and county judges, and, and I have to say, uh, the folks who are present here were very passionate, uh, and I th I'm really happy that, the, uh, that he heard what we have to say uh, on this. Uh, so uh, on this, I don't know who's going to go first, uh, but uh, we'll, let the, we'll let the hometown folks, uh, the, the mayor, we'll let uh, the, mayor uh, the mayor, the county judge, and uh, from here, you know, uh, Mayor Villalobos, and of course, uh, the judge, and then we'll let you take it from there. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah, thank you. Actually, it was a very interesting uh, conversation. And of course, we thank you, Congressman, for being here, and uh, Secretary Mayorkas. It's very important that we finally had somebody at the level that we were seeking. Of course, we couldn't get, uh, we can't get to our vice president, we can't get the president. Secretary Mayorkas is, uh, uh, fortunately, I think the person we needed, as the congressman expressed, there was a lot of issues. Uh, there was actually even I feel anger by our community, and I think he was listening. I really do. There's a lot of the issues that some may not understand. Uh, for example, Rio Grande, Laredo, even though they have the issues, they still don't have the issues McAllen has. You know what? Everybody wants to be number one, and McAllen is number one. But in this situation, I don't think we want to be. Uh, we we told or we talked, we informed what the issues are. At the very end, I think we know. One common thing we all had is curtail, curtail it, stop it, pause it, moratorium, whatever term you want to use, that's what we need. Give them time to fix a policy, do whatever they need to do. So that's what, that's what happened today, and I just want to once again express my Thanks to Congressman, uh, Secretary Mayorkas, and of course, everybody being here to support all of us. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank Congressman Cuello for bringing here, and of course, our Mayor Villalobos. To kind of summarize the meeting, he told us he knew what the problem was. And he knew that the model that the federal government is using is not sustainable and it's not working. So for us to try to define the problem over and over again does not solve the problem. So he wanted to hear from us as to what we thought would be helpful for them to consider in order for us to fix this. Well, as you can imagine, these are not easy solutions to find. If they were easy, we would have already 
done them and we've already been uh, implementing them. What we find ourselves is we're right in the middle of a pandemic. That pandemic is surging right now to a level, to a high point that a lot of people are very, very nervous. Where schools are gonna go back, children are gonna go back to school. Right now we have a governor that says that he doesn't want us to use masks. So we're preparing to send our children back into our schools without any protection whatsoever. We know that that is very dangerous. Why does that an additional concern be, be, be behind the obvious love for the children that we have is that we're already at pretty well capacity, capacity in our hospitals and our ability for us to serve people that need health care. What is the contribution of this immigrants to our health care burden? Right now we have 12, 25 people that are immigrants in our hospitals. 14 of them have COVID and 11 have other, other conditions. We want to humanely, safely take care of all people, including the immigrants that are here with us. But they're coming at a time that, that we need all the capacity we have in order for us to serve our community. So the suggestion that we gave him was to put a moratorium, and you can call it whatever you want to. I think, I'm not a lawyer, but I think a moratorium is nothing more than the legal delay of a law, is simply to stop, to stop the flow of assignments seeking immigrants because that is where the highest volume is coming. And it's a responsibility that belongs to the federal government, but however, the reason that we have also do us part and, and over 2,000 people also do us part is because the federal government doesn't have any place for us to take them. And when these people are turned loose, when they're turned loose by the, by, by the federal government, there are free people. There are free people. They can do and go anywhere they want to once here. But what happens when they do have COVID? What do, what do you want us to do? Just let them go free? That's why we made an investment to try to protect you, to protect you and protect them and put them in a place where we can really take care of them. So we're hopeful, we're hopeful that now that he understands the problem fully, that there's really only, there's only one quick solution that we need immediately because of the surge in numbers and that is to put a stop to the flow, and hopefully he'll come back with a plan to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm Pete Sines, Mayor of the City of Laredo. Uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Congressman Henry Cuellar and, of course, the uh, Secretary Mayorkas and his staff for uh, putting the meeting together. This is really my first encounter, so to speak, with, with someone other than our congressional leaders uh, to, to, you know, to visit with. Uh, this has been ongoing. The message was clear. Uh, you know, the, whatever system they're using is broken and needs fixing. Uh, we've, uh, I even questioned the uh, genuineness of the policies that are in place. Uh, you know, how serious are you all? And, and uh, it appears that it's taken too, too long to, uh, to truly start listening to the border community, at least I, I and others that hadn't had the opportunity of expressing ourselves. And the uh, dialogue was very candid, you know, very, very candid, very passionate, as, as some of us have expressed. But personally speaking, I think it, that had to be had. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. Uh, it's, it's been ongoing for months. And, uh, and we don't basically see any workable solutions. Uh, the mode here, uh, and with all due respect to our, our Secretary uh, Mayorkas, was basically a listening mode, just, just to take in. But we've been complaining, and people supposedly have been listening for some time, uh, but we needed solutions, uh, uh, short-term solutions. Uh, and this proposal that we're saying, uh, a moratorium, Pause it, you know, shut that valve uh, until such time as we have a plan in place. Washington put a plan in place, and basically that plan uh, should, you know, uh, should entail uh, a uh, more efficient way of dealing with the migrants, uh, adjudicate them quicker, have these federal judges here. Uh, why send them uh, further on north when we know that the vast majority of them will be returned? Uh, it makes no sense. We need efficiency. Uh, we're not even at that point yet. Uh, uh, we're asking for resources, 
Personally speaking, 70% of the solution is reinforced border patrol. Uh, those people uh, are tired, frustrated, they need reinforcements. Uh, and, uh, and I'm told that the, the border patrol budget uh, has not been increased. Uh, that's part of the solution. Uh, those are our, the people that we need to, to have side by side and reinforced. Uh, uh, because without them, it, you know, this thing is just going to continue to grow and mushroom and, and I don't know where it's going to take us, uh, but, uh, but apparently it's a tsunami now. And, uh, and something should have been done early on. That's the past. Hopefully now it, this is a step forward toward hopefully some solutions. The only thing I heard personally is that the uh, secretary and others have been visiting with Mexico. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful, uh, and that hopefully in the short term they, there may be some solutions that uh, could be effective for the border. Uh, I, I stand ready to, to listen to that. I stand ready also to do our part. But keep in mind, this is a federal issue created by failed federal policies, uh, and, uh, and they're expecting us, you know, smaller entities, communities, to bail them out. Uh, that's very, very unfair. Uh, and, uh, and, and I know we can do better as, as a country, uh, and, uh, and we should do better. And I'm expecting, my expectations are high. And I won't quit uh, complaining or talking until such time as we see some viable, uh, practical solutions, uh, be it Democrat, be it Republican. Uh, you know, we need to secure the border. Uh, way back then, each president brings their policies. We respect that. But here, uh, my understanding was that this current administration wanted to do a virtual wall, uh, an, an intelligent wall. Uh, and we haven't seen any elements of it. I personally haven't seen it. Uh, you know, I don't think you know, any of us. What does that consist of? Personnel. Bring more personnel, Border Patrol, CBP, uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, road building in our, in our river you know, edges uh, where Border Patrol will have a decent accessibility to <laughs> You know, to whoever's you know, coming across, uh, clearing the, the uh, brush area, you know, for lines of sight, that, that they ran on. Uh, but it's, what is it, eight months now? And we haven't seen any of that? Anyway, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. I'm good. Judge. Uh, I'm good. Judge. Mayor. <clears throat> There's no doubt that we have. Can you give your name? My name is Joel Villarreal, mayor of the great city of Rio Grande City. <laughs> there's no doubt that we have a humanitarian crisis, you know, there's no doubt. However, and I say this however, we have had a humanitarian crisis under every president, regardless of party, for the last several decades. Now, what are we going to do about it, right? At this point, if we continue in the same trajectory, then 10 years from today, we're going to have the same conversation. So what are we going to do now? Now, and that's one of the things that we need to propose is we need to prioritize immigration reform. We need to prioritize it. However, do we have the political will to address it? And so far, we have not. But, the, but for the short term, my colleagues, I echo the same, the same uh, sentiment. You know, we need real solutions to what is happening here. And I know we're going to continue to work with the different uh, entities to make this happen. However, it is time that we address this from a comprehensive standpoint as a, and again, avoid having the same conversation for the next 10, 15 years. So again, and I want to stress this, it is not on a single party. It's not the rare or blue, it's the red, white, and blue. I know somebody mentioned that. Point is, how do we address it? together. How do we go about addressing it from the root? And then as well, help out our communities with the, we have to increase the resources that's necessary to manage the flow of migrants. There's no doubt. So with that, it was a very successful meeting. I think we are going to get some true results and I am confident that we're going to go in that direction. And the gentleman here, we all stress the same sentiments. We need real solutions to what is happening here. And of course, our constituents are asking us as well, what is gonna happen? So with that, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Weber County Judge, Donald Tijerina. 
You know, everybody's talking about this border crisis. Well, some media outlets are talking about these border crises, not all of them, which is fathoms to me to begin with. All of us up here have taken many, many hits locally. And my expression is this. We're at the local authorities. You have the state, then you have the federal. We are fighting a battle with our hands behind our backs and unarmed. We need the federal government. We need President Biden to be looking down here and taking care of not just the red, not just the blue, but the red, white, and blue because we all are Americans. I'm going to tell you this. People have been saying this for a while already on the media outlets constantly, uh, is that it's a border crisis. Let me tell you all something. Let me stop you all right there and then. This is not just a border crisis. This is an America, United States of America crisis. Why? Because these people that are seeking asylum, which by the way, all of us up here, we will give our shirts off our back to RIMS, to, re to refugees, immigrants, and migrants. We will. We're doing everything we can. Our NGOs are fighting daily for us to be able to help in our local authorities. Constantly, our non-governmental organizations are constantly working hard. Half of these people that are being bused, there's 40% positive rate of COVID, 40%. The other three hours that they've been on the bus, let's say, I'm talking about Webb County, when they get there, they've already, that's 100% exposure. And by the way, they test them. Government doesn't test them, federal government doesn't test them, the local authorities test them, which is a problem in itself. Why? Because, and I, I'm just gonna speculate here, but the problem is, is this, if they start testing them, what are they gonna do with them? Because now there's gonna be a lot more eyebrows being raised because there is a major problem that most of the country's not aware of. I have friends all over the country thinking I would hate to be down there in the border. And I tell them, well, I would hate to be where you're at. And they said, why? I said, because these people are flying or busing to your location near you with the COVID. Look, this is nothing different than 2014 and 2019. You, we, we, we didn't even have these kind of meetings in 2419 because the major difference is COVID. COVID. I do not like the fact that we have to go into, a, into an airport and they're telling you over and over again that your health is our highest priority. Federal government is telling you that. Well, I'm here to say, prove it to us. Ex prove it to us. Because we want to help the federal government. Help us, help you. This is what we stand for. This is where we're all together today. Thank you to Congress and Cuellar. Thank you to all these gentlemen that are behind me. Because we need to stay united. Because this is not just a border issue. This is an American issue that we all need to deal with today. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Anybody else? Why don't, why don't we uh, close up for questions? Can we speak in Spanish? Oh, en español, ok. Unas palabras en español. Bueno, primero tuvimos una junta muy importante con el secretario este, Mallorcas, donde este, por meses de enero lo ha este, pidió que este, se debe de juntar con las comunidades. Es muy importante este, que no nomás este, oigan de las personas que quieren la reforma de migración que todos nosotros queremos, los activistas, pero también debe de tomar el tiempo Uh, con este, la, la, las comunidades en la frontera y con los hombres y mujeres en verde y azul también. Fue algo muy importante, hablamos y, este, y ahorita lo voy a dejar este, a los uh, alcaldes y los jueces que digan unas palabras en español, pero fue importante que venga aquí uh, a, este, a oír a los jueces, a las, este, los alcaldes, y ahora en la mañana estuvo con los jefes de policías y también con los sheriffes también, ahora en la tarde va a estar con los uh, NGOs, uh, Catholic Services y otras personas. Es importante que deben de entender que lo que estamos viendo ahorita es algo muy difícil. Uh, como dijo este, el juez este, Tejerina, lo vimos en 12, 14, I mean, este, 2014, Uh, 2019, ahora en este año, pero la cosa que es muy, muy diferente es que tenemos el problema con COVID-19. Hablamos también este, que debemos de abrir los puentes y si lo pedimos a él, si, si se sienten con las comunidades en la, en la frontera, pueden hallar una manera donde este, se pueden abrir los puentes, porque ustedes saben, antes del COVID venían más de 18 millones de mexicanos, donde gastaban más de 19 billones de dólares en los Estados Unidos. Es decir, lo que estamos viendo es, uh, mexicanos pueden volar, entrar a los Estados Unidos, Uh, las personas sin documentos, que estamos hablando de más de 1.3 uh, 
millones de personas que van a cruzar nomás este año pueden entrar, pero los mexicanos que tengan las visas que vienen a gastar dinero aquí no pueden entrar. Y por eso este, tuvimos una buena dis uh, discusión. Uh, este, también él estuvo en México, este, donde esperamos, me dijo, porque yo tuve una junta con él antes, y me dijo, vamos a hacer unos este, anuncios este, pronto, porque es importante que el gobierno americano trabe, trabaje con el gobierno mexicano para parar esto. En 2014, 2015, uh, cuando la administración de Obama estaba trabajando con ellos, con los mexicanos, México estaba parando más personas que el Border Patrol de los Estados Unidos. Es que sí hay una manera de trabajar con los mexicanos. Y esperamos con la ayuda que más de 7 millones de vac vacunas que lo hagamos, lo vamos a dar a los mexicanos. Esperamos que este, trabajen con nosotros un poquito más. Uh, en esto, unas palabras en español, ya que tomamos las preguntas en inglés, en español y francés. ¿Qué era su reacción cuando ustedes le, le pidieron que pare el grupo de los que están buscando asilo? ¿Qué era su reacción? Y sí. también, ¿por qué no han hecho algo? Sí, y, mira, eh, eh, lo, lo que queremos, este, y ya el... el um, Uh, yo lo pidió a la administración unas cosas. Primero deben de parar y deportar personas que no deben de estar aquí. Ustedes saben que si hay 100 personas aquí, si se van a frente de un juez de migración, el 88%, 90% se van a rechazar. ¿Por qué estamos dejando a todas las personas entrar este, en, una, en una cosa uh, falsa? Porque sabemos que muchos de ellos, este, casi el, el 90% se van a rechazar y se van a, este, a regresar. Uh, creemos que se va a regresar porque ahorita hay más de un millón de personas con una orden donde se deben de deportar y todavía están aquí. Y eso es algo que este, necesitamos que ver. Están tomando unas posiciones, pero cuando lo pedimos este, que debe de parar, este, no recibimos la pregunta o la respuesta que debemos de recibir. I don't know if anybody wants to answer the matter. Sure, a little something. Lo que ha pasado es que cuando tuvimos nuestra nuestra junta con el secretario Mayorca, una de las cosas que le expresamos y seguimos expresando que este tema de migración no es municipal, no es del condado, no es ni del gobernador. Ok, so, entonces le estamos explicando, mira, tienen que hacer algo. We, como dicen en inglés, the buck stops here. Aquí, ¿quiénes son los que tienen que ser? Y esos son los federales. Sea el presidente con una orden ejecutiva o sea el Congreso que actúen. Hemos tratado y hemos hablado con ellos tocante muy, muchas veces, tocante que hablan de comprehensive immigration reform uh, te, para arreglar todo. No lo están haciendo. Les hemos decidido, mira, arreglen DACA, es un tema que hasta la mayoría de los republicanos están a favor y la mayoría de los demócratas arreglen eso y no lo han arreglado. Arreglen, arreglen the guest worker program, porque necesitamos trabajadores. Sabemos que nuestros trabajadores están más altos de edad. Sabemos que, que la, el número de, de gente, de niños que están haciendo está bajo. Necesitamos trabajadores, pero no lo hacen. Y ahora estamos en el tema de esto, que es un tema que no nos pertenece a nosotros y miren cómo estamos. Aquí estamos todos con este problema que no ha sido creado por nosotros, pero exigen que nosotros nos metanos y hagamos el trabajo de Dios. Y eso no es correcto. Solo le pedimos, como hemos dicho, mira, lo, lo más importante ahorita, mientras que toman tiempo para arreglar sus pólizas en Washington, es paren paren la, el movimiento de los inmigrantes. Cualquier manera, sea por or, orden ejecutiva, sea por póliza del Congreso, hagan algo. Y eso no estamos teniendo el problemita. De que nos ayudan con, con dinero, con fondos, nos están ayudando. Pero ese no es el tema. El, el tema es que siguen cruzando y ahora, no es como era hace tres, hace tres semanas, dos, tres semanas, antes lo podíamos controlar. Ahora no lo podemos controlar. Y luego le pones el tema también de COVID. COVID se ha levantado entre los inmigrantes de 4 o 6 por ciento, ahora arriba de 15, 16 por ciento. Y lo que no entiende mucha gente es que no tenemos 
autoridad para detenerlos. Si ellos se quieren ir, se van. Ahora tenemos familias de East Coast, de, Cali de California, de, 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 from the West Coast, de East Coast, vienen y los levantan. ¿Qué creen que está pasando con, con las enfermedades? So, no es solamente el tema de inmigración. Ahora es el tema de inmigración y también el tema de la salud de nuestro país, porque se está esparramando en todo el país. Es, esperamos, le, le explicamos y claro que dijo que va a checar en esas cosas, porque claro que no nos puede decir inmediatamente las pólizas que están haciendo, pero esperamos que ojalá que tengamos una, una respuesta favorable. We keep hearing different positivity rates from different communities, and I understand. So is it, it's up to each community to try and figure out if it can test those immigrants being released. Is that correct? Is there any way to get an across-the-board accurate representation of positivity rates? Yeah, look, look, um, the federal government, and, and this is when this first came up at the very beginning, because I, December 11, 2020, I was telling the Biden administration, hey, guys, Y'all better look at the transition team. I said, you better look at because the numbers are rising. They started under the Trump administration. They started going up. But in January, uh, they really shot up. And you've seen the numbers uh, that are being coming up. Uh, I think uh, fiscal year, over 1.3 million. So at the very beginning, I said, are y'all going to test them? Well, first of all, and I think, uh, uh, Judge, you said this, they were not even vaccinating their own Border Patrol. I called their, the administration. Uh, in December said, hey, we got vaccines. Are y'all going to do that? And they said, it's going to be complicated. They said, what do you mean complicated? Well, they got to go to the local folks or to the VA. These folks stood up and they vaccinated most of the Border Patrol and uh, CBP officers. So start off with that. Uh, uh, vaccination of their own people. It was done by the local government. Second of all, uh, on the testing, they said, we don't do testing. That's not our mission. So then it basically became a local issue, according to, uh, to mainly to the NGO. So that's why we have different things. Is there something across the policy? I looked at that at the very beginning. They, they, they're not going to do it. So therefore, the burden, as it's been repeated over and over again, falls on the local government. If there is a reimbursement, as you know, uh, the program, actually, we had Michael Lee, the head of the emergency food and shelter. Uh, I, I think the Valley knows this very well because I've said this uh, over many years. Uh, the first model that I set up in 2014, the money was supposed to go federal government to the state. It got stuck at the state government and the local governments. So in 2019, I changed the law to allow it to go directly to the local governments. And now anybody can ask their local uh, United Way and they can make the applications and it's working. But as I said, the money helps, but it doesn't solve the issue of this overflow. The speed bump that we have here, large numbers. When you're getting here in the Valley, 20,000 people plus a week. And remember, you, and, and you know this very well, that what we're seeing right now is that traditionally March, April, May, and June, this is the peak months. July, August, they're not stopping. In fact, they're increasing right now. So it's a more on a case-by-case -case basis according to the local governments. Mayor Sines, we briefly talked with you a couple days ago. Can you first of all explain or tell us how many migrants are being treated at your local hospitals as more than 40 await a bed? Correct. Uh, yeah, there's been a process there in the city of Laredo where we're taking the overflow of the RGV area, you know, this area here into Laredo, uh, to a tune of uh, 200 more or less a day. Uh, it, it's gotten to the point in Laredo that we had to file a lawsuit against the federal government simply because we didn't, we had very limited NGO capacity and then they got quarantined and then to top it off, our hospital capacity uh, is extremely limited. We're uh, severely underserved uh, community uh, medically, uh, primarily because lack of staffing as, as many hospitals throughout the state are, are now experiencing. Uh, so uh, we had no other choice but to enter into the busing agency business, you know, the city of Laredo. So, so in essence now, you know, we settled the lawsuit. Uh, Border Patrol actually takes uh, uh, these 200 migrants uh, to their facility and, and they process and then quickly they, they uh, take them to a facility that the city owns and then we in turn bus them. But, but the question we get is, Mayor, you, uh, you're not testing? You know, how, how insensitive, uh, uh, how, how irresponsible uh, 
we don't have the capacity and we don't have the infrastructure. Uh, although the NGOs, uh, they're, they're good natured, they want to do the best they can, but their capacity is also, I think, uh, Holding Institute is, is the largest uh, you know, NGO. Their capacity for positives is uh, 75, uh, uh, and, and then with the families. So anyway, it, it, uh, it's created such a big issue. Uh, we're not blaming the uh, migrants, frankly, uh, you know, for the uh, hospital situation or, or the COVID. You know, some communities, they may impact. Yeah, and, 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 and I want to be clear about that too. Uh, the migrants are not contributing to the COVID situation in the Laredo area. Just ourselves, our residents are having such a big issue. They're even you know, fighting for beds. Uh, so uh, for the last nine days, we had zero ICU beds in Laredo uh, and about 40 people and, and over for waiting. Uh, the hospitals go under version frequently. So you know, we're having big issues uh, you know, medically. And we don't have a pediatric uh, facility or, or unit there too, so that even further complicates it. So it's forcing us to just take the migrants. Uh, we don't test, and then they they go to you know, different cities in Texas uh, to make their connections to further uh, follow their journey uh, uh, northward uh, to to other cities in in the U.S. But to be clear, none of those people hospitalized are migrants. No, 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 very. Uh, from the uh, okay. Yeah, no, no. Currently, currently, no, we get one or two maybe every other day or something like those lines. The last one we've had, I think, was a three month old child that had COVID and, uh, and, and pneumonia, and, and that child had to be transferred someplace else. So, so again, it's not the, the migrant population that's, that's, that's uh, totally impacting, but it's gotten to the point now that, that any other layer of population that comes into our community is truly, truly fighting for a bed there in, in the city of Laredo. And I personally feel, and I think, yeah, I don't want to speak for the other uh, uh, mayors, but our, our people should have a preferential right. I mean, they live there. The federal government has a choice. You know, the federal government can take them someplace else. Uh, so we have to protect our people. Uh, and, and at this point, every bed is, is important. Uh, thank you. How did Secretary yeah. Mayorkas actually... No, perdón. Sí, como no, en español. Uh, cinco minutos más, uh, con mucho permiso. Okay. Pero, one, one, you want to summarize? Yeah. One more question, uh, uh, Mayor. Okay, we have five minutes. Yeah. I promise it'll be very quick. How did uh, Secretary Mayorkas react to your plan of shutting down the border to all migrants? Well, he listened. Uh, the, the point of consolation, if you can call it that, was that uh, he said that he had been visiting with uh, some of the uh, Mexican uh, top officials and that apparently uh, they're working on, on a solution and that he would disclose that solution sometime in the future, hopefully in the very near future, hopefully, you know, that's, that's my hope. But that's, that's the extent of, uh, and that they've been working also and, and having these migrants uh, apply remotely, you know, from, from their you know, countries of origin or, or somewhere close to those countries. Can I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. Let's allow a couple of people from San Antonio and Laredo to ask a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, perdón? Sí, gracias por la pregunta. Para nosotros es un acto de desesperación. No tenemos otra manera de, de expresarnos. Nos han forzado el gobierno federal en, en darnos esta uh, cuestión, este problema que, que totalmente debe ser uh, resuelto por el gobierno federal, pero tenemos que, que tratarlo nosotros. Uh, y estamos haciendo todo lo posible en, en la mejor manera humana De, de, de tratar con los migrantes también. Tenemos nuestra gente y tenemos el, el, los migrantes también. Pero yo digo, el gobierno federal tiene una opción. ¿Para qué ponernos esa presión a, a los locales cuando actualmente ellos tienen los recursos requeridos si, si gustan, por voluntad propia, pero no han ejercido esa voluntad? Y es lo que queremos ver, un, una expresión de voluntad del gobierno federal a, uh, y, y eso es muy injusto, uh, pienso yo en mi, en, en mi propia you know, opinión. Uh, uh, 
no se trata de, queremos tratar lo mejor que se pueda, pero no tenemos, y hay igual punto que estamos al, a lo mínimo. Gracias. No, mira. Okay. Si la solución, bueno, no ofreció soluciones a Miguel, uh, vino a escuchar y escuchó bastante y escuchó a lo mejor además, porque uno <risa> nuestros aquí estu, estu, estuvo algo apasionado a la táctica, pero creo yo que, que esa, es, esa es la frustración que tenemos. Uh, y uh, no hubo soluciones, pero sí, sí nos platicó que había hablado con, con oficiales mexicanos y que, que están trabajando en una solución. No nos dio cuándo iba a, a, a pronunciarse esa a solución, pero esperemos que nos ayuden. Pero hasta la fecha el sistema está quebrado y se requieren muchas soluciones. Is there, uh, before we go, uh, sorry, I want to be fair to everybody. Anybody from San Antonio, we heard from Laredo, San Antonio, if not, let, let me be fair to a couple of folks. Thank you, Congressman. I'm from San Antonio, this is Brendan Gibbons, San Antonio Report. Uh, I was wondering if you had... Well, his question was, uh, What are Brett Cuellar's views on the DHS contract with family endeavors to house migrant children in hotels, including the facility in Becos? Did he discuss this? I apologize this that in there. I was asking about the DHS contract with endeavors. Um, did you have a chance to discuss that contract with the secretary? Do you have any no, we, we, we uh, focus more on what was happening. We focus more on what was happening down here at the border, uh, the uh, frustration that the border communities, the burn that the border communities are facing here. So we did not go into any other particular contracts uh, with them. Uh, this is the only thing we uh, focus on. Question, Thank and then you. question. Thank you, Congressman, for looking out for me. Uh, my question for is first for the Webb County judge. Uh, you mentioned a 40% COVID positivity rate for migrants. I was wondering how you got that number. And then I had a question for anyone who would like to answer. Two groups about, about, well, That's a, that's a great question and I appreciate it. And let me just go ahead and, and uh, for the record. So what's happening is, in all reality, Del Rio sector and the RGV sector is taking pretty much the majority of the immigrants coming in. Good thing about Webb County is, and I say good thing because it's not really that good of a thing, but what's happening is they're kind of going around us. And what they're saying is, the reason why they're going around us is because the cartels across, us, across the river are actually charging a little bit more. Whether that's true, or false, we don't know, but that's kind of, we're kind of seeing that, that trend going. The point where we're trying to make is, we're getting about four to six buses from RGV to Laredo because that's where, the, that's where they start uh, processing. It's called a processing center, okay? So what they're saying is, every single, because they obviously know the federal government's not testing, so when the buses get to the destination of Webb County, pretty much when the NGOs test them, they're noticing and they're finding out that 40% of the people that are in the buses pretty much have COVID. What does that tell you? And that's why I said it's 100%, you've already infected, infected already 100% because they've already been in the bus almost three and a half hours over there. So right around there, the answer to your question is that's how we're finding out. Our NGOs are testing almost every bus and it's around 40%. When the NGOs test them, they actually stay, our NGOs are they're staying 10 days, quarantining them for 10 days, and then they're giving them a vaccination before they leave to their destination. Not necessarily all of them, but these are the ones that are happening too. So Thank is you. the way that we're processing migrants spreading COVID since they're in such close proximity? Um, re repeat the question, I'm sorry? Is the way that we're processing migrants spreading COVID since they're in such close proximity? I would have to assume yes. Uh, two more questions here and then uh, we're going to close up. Oh, what, no. you going to let Steve go first? Okay. <laughs> Or you're, you're a gentleman, a scholar? Okay. <laughs> Steve? Yeah, you said earlier that it's about 20,000 came across in the valley last week or this week. Well, three weeks ago, uh, it was uh, 20,000 plus. Uh, two weeks ago, it was 21,000. And then it was uh, 22,000 last week. So it, I'll say an average of a little bit over 20,000 in just the RGV. Okay. Are they telling you what percentage of those they're releasing into the community and what percentage have been sent straight back? To Mexico. Yeah, uh, I don't have the uh, the ones uh, here to the valley. I can get them, uh, but I can tell you 
Title VIII and Title 42 are being used, as you know. Uh, Title 42, you don't deport, you expel people uh, under that, uh, under that. So, and I'll be happy to show you some of the numbers here. I got the general numbers. So Title 42 is being used to expel most of them. If you are a, look, if you're three profiles, if you're an un, un, uh, unaccompanied kid, you pretty much are gonna come in. Uh, your family units, some are being deported as long as the kids are not under the age, I hear age of six, whatever. And then of course, depends on what the Mexican government, Tamaulipas, whatever, that's why they have those lateral movements, as you know, to find a place that they can send them. Uh, and then, but if you're an adult, most adults are gonna be expelled. In Laredo, you know, Laredo, for example, uh, we get very uh, a few numbers of unaccompanied kids and family units. About 90, 95 percent are single adults from mainly from Mexico, so most of them are, are, are being returned. So it depends on whether you're the Rio, Laredo, or the Valley okay. and, and the profile. And then the judge said 40 percent in Laredo has COVID. Do you know the percentage in the Valley? Well, no. No, 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 no. Well, we Just real quick, it. I'll let him answer that. But what I meant, what I, what I was saying is, 40 percent when they're being bused to Laredo, so they're actually coming from the valley. So that, you know, that just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, actually, actually, we're very fortunate that even though it has been going up, the the positivity rate here has been has gone from four to six to eight to a little over 60 percent. But I understand the issues, the problems face, that Laredo is facing now if they're traveling together with some positive cases by the time they get there they're ha they may be having these issues but here in hidalgo county or at least uh, our area uh, whether it be in el salduas or at the catholic charity center in downtown mccallan the positivity rate has been about a little in excess of 15 okay. percent last question Esa, esa información no, no la tenemos porque no es la obligación. Muchas veces lo que pasa, los hacen test, pero de vacunar nosotros no hacemos parte de eso. Uh, uh, Congressman, apart from the, uh, the COVID situation and, and, the, and the logistical nightmare of uh, processing so many people, what really is the impact on communities here economically, socially, politically? I mean, it's pretty well contained, right? It's been, the flow is, is, is contained, people are very overwhelmed, but I mean, the respite center here is handling the situation. Uh, Laredo is handling the situation. Yeah, I, look. If, if you're a resident of North Laredo, is this really bothering you? Uh, Besides the optics. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, you if, if I may, you know what? Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I'd say 90, probably 98 percent of the population in in McAllen wasn't really concerned about this because everything was pretty orderly. You'd have the border patrol drop off. Catholic charities pick up, take care of the issue. Unfortunately, about two, three weeks ago is when we started having this. So now a vast number of our population knows. Two weeks ago or a week ago, we had to take an emergency action where we set up a, a couple of tents because we got a call from Catholic charities that they were going to have to release 200 plus immigrants into the community. COVID or non-COVID, we didn't know. We had to take an action. We had about 30 minutes to do something, and we did. We acted, and we took, we placed a few tents uh, on 23rd Street, which were going to be there temporary just for, for a night while we figure out what we were going to do. The next day, uh, thanks to Commissioner Ever Villarreal, we were able to relocate to Juan Salduas, which to us was a much better place. Now, you ask what about the economy? McAllen had been doing great. We have been doing great. Uh, it's a great place, and it still is. It's said the seventh safest city in the country, and we want to keep it that way. That's why, even though it's not our responsibility to be involved in immigration for the purposes of public safety and uh, the health of our community, we're going to do what we have to do, and we're going to keep on doing it. And fortunately, we're getting assistance from the federal government through FEMA, and that's very helpful. Our economy, though, has been good. It, it, uh, of course, we had an infusion of, of, of cash last year through the CARES Act, and now again through uh, what is it? American Rescue Plan. Rescue. So we're, we're, we're doing okay. But even without that, our economy in McAllen is strong. But we're concerned about what's going to happen once the numbers start picking up again, because now, even though before to me, I didn't see a correlation between the rise in Hidalgo County or the country as far as COVID and the immigration uh, numbers, 
now we have issues because now you go, they're picking up or trying to pick up family members uh, in Ansaldua, whether they're positive or not, they're picking them up. So it's not a border issue, it's not a border crisis, it's a United States issue and crisis. And, uh, and that's why we're very glad that uh, Senator Mayorkas came in today and hopefully he will address some of the issues. Yeah. Can it, I have a quick answer for the gentleman? Yeah, he said... Uh, yeah, it's not optics. <laughs> definitely not optics. Why would it matter for a, for a Laredo resident to, you know, to, to be concerned? Hosp lack of hospital capacity. Correct. Be it a migrant, be it a resident, you know, even ourselves as residents, we're having a huge issue with uh, you know, hospital beds and, and, the, and, and the overflow. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, I just want to add it, and we're going to close up with this, and I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. But look, it, it's, it's not a matter of optics. I mean, look, when you have resources, when you have resources that are taken from the city because they have to, and, and the mayor and I and the judge, we all have uh, spoken about this. It's more than just optics. Uh, look, we care. We want to be compassionate with the, uh, with the immigrants, uh, especially once the children are here. We're going to treat those children, uh, for example, like if they're our own children itself. But when the local communities are being burdened, and imagine if you were a mayor and you're limited with uh, hospital beds, and then you have somebody that's from uh, Laredo uh, versus somebody that might not be fair, it puts them in a very difficult situation. So it's a, more than a matter of optics. This is reality that we're seeing down here. And I think, uh, you know, some of y'all have heard me on national TV, and I told the secretary, hey, listen, because I've gotten some phone calls of what I say on national TV, I said, all I'm doing is just repeating what you're hearing here today and from other public officials that we have from the Rio all the way to Brownsville. So with that, I say thank you so much and it's a pleasure being here with you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Placer. Thank you.